Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our seventh Vital Voices session of this uh, academic year. We started our Vital Voices sessions uh, about three years ago to serve as a forum to bring scholars, practitioners, UHD alumni to speak to students, faculty, uh, and community partners at UHD's College of Public Service. It's, it's our hope that the people we invite to speak will share from their heart, their professional experiences, their knowledge, and how the work that they do impacts, um, impacts society as a whole. Uh, we like to feature people whose work is interdisciplinary and touches upon the fields that we have in this college, which is social work, criminal justice, and urban education. A brief recap, back in, in October, we, uh, we had a, a session on public service at the core, and that was talking about um, uh, Harris County Sheriff's Office working with um, iPads, and the, those iPads were connected to um, health professionals, uh, mental health professionals, to help them deal with uh, populations that needed that might need that help as, as officers were on the street. Um, then following that, we had a session with Dr. Laura Mitchell on social and emotional learning, especially in the era of COVID, how working professionals need to take care of themselves so they can better take care of their constituents, their students, or their customers, whatever the case may be. Then we followed that up with a uh, presentation by author um, uh, Carol Tavris, who spoke on mistakes were made, but not by me. Uh, that talks about cognitive dissonance and how we um, also always think that there's a problem, but it's not us. And we have implicit biases that we're not aware of. Not that we're bad people, we're just not aware of it. And so we talked about that. Uh, in, uh, in November, we had a session uh, about grading students from home and in hybrid formats, the difficulties and the challenges with that. We had an international uh, grading expert come and talk to us about that. Then last month, we had uh, 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 reporter Carrie Blakinger, and she spoke about the trouble with authorities, her journey from a prisoner to a prison's reporter. And she worked at the Houston Chronicle, and she also she now works at the Marshall Project, which is a national organization. And she talked about what life was like for her beyond bars, uh, behind bars rather, and and what it's like for her now as a prison's reporter. The insights that she brings to that. Next month, uh, our final Vital Voices of the of the academic year, we're going to be talking to Dr. Rachel Gente, and she's going to be talking to us, to us about the um, the issues that COVID-19 has highlighted among our elderly population, um, how, how, how COVID has, has highlighted the disparities in the care of older adults. And as many of us are caring for older adults, whether you're in your 20s or in your 50s, uh, this is a very, um, it's gonna be a very surprising and an important topic for us to talk about. And so before we get into today's session, I'd like to introduce you to our Dean, uh, Jonathan Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz has been with us now just shy of two years. We were just talking about that. It's amazing how time flies. Um, Dr. Schwartz, uh, in my opinion, has really brought about many changes uh, to our college and even to the university. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our Dean, Dr. Jonathan Schwartz. Thank you very much, Stephen. And welcome to Vital Voices. Uh, we're excited you, you chose to attend today and we're very excited about this Vital Voices. At the College of Public Service, we're really about impacting the community and, and having high class, world class education for our students. So we have award winning programs, as Stephen mentioned, in education, in criminal justice, and in social work. And we think a lot about the, the issues going on in Houston and how we can help solve them. And the school to prison pipeline is a major issue we think about. Uh, and we think about diversifying the teaching field, the social work field, the criminal justice field, and that representation matters. So it's amazing to have someone who's had the life journey that Damon West has had uh, speaking today. So I'm going to let him really tell his story, but just know that he is a best-selling author. He's an in-demand, nationally known speaker, and he's someone who's had an amazing life journey from starting as a Division I quarterback to a life sentence in prison, to getting out and changing the world. So we're excited to have him as a speaker, and I'd like to introduce Damon West.
Dean Schwartz, thanks a lot. I got, I got myself unmuted. Can y'all see me okay? Is, is my lighting okay, Dean Schwartz? Yes, sir. You look great. We're good. Okay, great. <laughs> I don't know about that. But y'all, listen, it is so much of an honor to be here today. University of Houston downtown gave me an opportunity in life that few people from my background will ever get. And, and it's, in, it's interesting. We're going to kind of weave into this story today and tell you the connections to it. But there's a adjunct professor there named Lynn Rizika who invited me to speak to her class one day. And, and at the end of the story, I'll tell you the role that Lynn Rizika played. But I spoke to Lynn Rizika's class, I think it was August of 2019. And, and after that presentation was over, one of the professors was in the back of the room, Dr. Michael Cavanaugh, and he came up and he said, hey, man, I heard you've got a master's in criminal justice from Lamar University. Is that, is that right? And I was like, yeah, you know, I just got my master's recently. And we started the conversation up about me coming to University of Houston downtown and, and, and teaching the prisons class there. And in the prisons class, a friend of mine is, is actually there, was there teaching it. He teaches uh, an ethics class now, Terry Pelt, who was a former warden in TDCJ. And, and so and Terry and I actually co-taught uh, some of his ethics classes. We had a plan to co-teach the prisons class together, but then COVID hit. COVID hit. COVID, man, the, the absolute biggest adversity most of us have ever seen in our lifetimes, not just uh, here locally, but in the world. I'm going to tell you a story today about finding the opportunities in adversity, because inside of every adverse, difficult situation, there's opportunities. And sometimes you got to dig deep to find them. I'm going to tell you a story about a time in my life when I put myself into a very adverse situation and I had to find, I had to find the opportunities inside that adversity. So let's jump right in and start this story out. We're going to start it off on uh, July 30th, 2008. So I'm sitting around this little rundown apartment in Dallas, Texas, and I'm sitting on this little ratty old couch and I've got my meth dealer sitting next to me on the couch. Probably got everybody's attention now. I mean, I'm talking about doing meth, right? So I'm sitting there on this couch and I got my meth dealer, this guy named Tex. And I'm sitting there smoking meth with Tex and I'm, I'm passing the pipe back and forth and I'm telling Tex, Tex, I think the end is near. I think the cops are about to come get me. You see, 10 days before this, this guy had been doing all these burgers within Dallas. This guy named Dustin had been picked up by the Dallas Police Department. I mean, they've got my partner in crime in custody. So I know it's just a matter of time before they get to me. And just as I passed the pipe back to Tex, I heard a window shatter off to my right, you know, whoosh, and tumbling across my living room floor was this little canister going end over end. And it starts to register what's going on in my mind. It's like a, like a slow motion reel from a movie as I'm watching this canister bounce across my floor. And I got up off the couch and I tried to get out of that living room. And just as I got over that canister, boom, the flashbang grenade went off right in my face. Bright white light, loud noise, bullets me back on the couch. And when I came to, when I can see and hear again, this cop in full SWAT right here, man. He's got his boot on my chest and the barrel of an assault rifle is digging in my eye socket. And I can feel the barrel up against my eyeball, y'all. It's cold, it's stinging. And he's got his finger on the trigger and this cop is screaming at the top of his lungs, don't move, don't move. Man, I looked at this cop and I blinked and I was like, man, don't worry, don't worry. So cops are flooding my apartment and one of them screams out, we got it. We got the uptown burglar. The uptown burglar. Y'all, it doesn't matter how many people's lives I can possibly impact with the story today, how many students' lives I can possibly impact with my, my story when I go into the classrooms and teach to them about prisons in America, I'll never be able to escape that name, that moniker, the Uptown Burger. That's the consequences of my decision. And I tell students and, and audiences everywhere I go, the consequences of your decisions run with you for the rest of your life. About a dozen other meth addicts and myself, young and old, male and female, black and white, and everything in between, because drugs and addiction do not discriminate. But we indiscriminately and without reservation broke into the homes of dozens of people in the uptown neighborhood of Dallas to feed our insatiable meth habits. But on July 30th, 2008, the uptown burglars, they came to an end. That's when they, they had their man. They, they zip tied me in the floor of that apartment. They took me down to Dallas County Jail, processed me in fingerprints, mug shots, the works, y'all. They threw me in a holding cell. I spent the first 24 hours of my incarceration. And it really, I've got one thought going through my head. And it's not about my victims. I've got a bunch of victims at this point, y'all. It's not about my family. Man, my family, I put my family through hell at this point, y'all. I don't even care about myself. I've got a first degree felony for organized crime hanging over my head with a potential life sentence in prison. 
And the only thing I care about is getting out and getting high and getting out and getting high, one form or another, either bailing out and getting high or getting probation at my trial and getting high. And at the end of 10 months in Dallas County Jail, Dallas County finally gave me my day in court. Actually, they gave me six days in court. And six days is a long criminal trial in the state of Texas for crimes that are non-aggravated. No one was ever home during the commission of my burden. No one's ever physically hurt, never saw my victim. But at the end of six days, that jury of my peers listened to so much overwhelming evidence of my guilt, of the crime of engaging in organized criminal activity, that they went to deliberate for 10 minutes on my sentence, y'all. 10 minutes. Man, I don't know how much law and order y'all watch, but if a jury's gone for 10 minutes, they smoked you. And when I came back into that courtroom, that judge who hadn't smiled the entire trial, he's grinning from ear to ear, and he said, Damon Joseph West, you are hereby sentenced to 65 years in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. 65 years, y'all, is a life sentence in Texas. Anything 60 and above is life in Texas. A jury gave me life that day. They threw me away. Now, obviously, I didn't do life in prison because I'm standing in front of you today. This isn't my former prison cell because we don't have prisons this nice in Texas. I didn't do a full life sentence in prison. I did seven years and three months in a maximum security penitentiary in Beaumont, Texas called the Mark Stiles Unit. And at the end of seven years and three months, the parole board came to visit me. They came to see me November 16, 2015. I'm up for parole for the first time. I've got zero expectations of making parole that day. And the lady that interviews me for parole comes in and she's, uh, she's looking at my file for a few minutes and then she closes it. And she said, Mr. West, I'm going to be honest with you. We don't see a lot of people come through state prison like you. She said, you had every opportunity in life, every advantage, every privilege in life. And she said, but you threw it all away. You became a meth addict. You became a burglar. You became a thief. You made a lot of victims. She said, and a jury gave you life in prison for the things you did. She said, but instead of letting that license define you, she said, you changed yourself inside this prison. She said, as a matter of fact, you changed the entire prison around you. She says, so I've got one question for you today, Mr. West. One question only. Here it is, y'all. One question is going to decide whether or not I go home or stay in prison. She said, if you could be remembered for being anything in life, anything at all, she said, give it to me in just one word, go. And man, you talk about an easy question for a coffee bean to answer. I thought she was going to ask me something difficult, something tough. I fired her answer back at her real quick, and I said, ma'am, useful. I just want to be useful, and I can be useful in this prison, or I can be useful out in the free world finding those coffee beans. And she said, you know what, Mr. West? She said, we're going to vote on you. We're going to give you a vote real soon. And they did. They voted on me real soon, and the lady that voted on me to make parole, my lead voter in parole, was a woman named Lynn Rizika. That Lynn Rizika. The same Lynn Rizika's class I spoke to in August of 2019 Whenever she invited me to speak to her class, Lynn Rizika was my lead parole voter in my case. The lead parole voter that gave me the thumbs up that allowed me to go home on November 16, 2015. Home on a lifetime of parole. Now, honestly, y'all, I'm on parole for the rest of my life, but I mean, I'm not worried about parole. And that's not some kind of cavalier statement that says I don't, I don't listen to authority. I, I listen to everything authority. I, that social contract, I take very seriously, y'all. I do everything authority tells me to do. Parole, parole tells me to jump. I tell them how high. How many times can I jump for you, parole? When I tell you I don't care about parole and I'm not worried about parole is this. I'm a coffee bean. And the only way a coffee bean is going back into a prison is when this coffee bean wants to go share his message with the men and women left behind in that prison to share his experience, strength, and hope. That's how I go back to prison today, y'all. Before I tell you about the coffee bean, let me tell you my backstory. Let me tell you where I came from. Let me tell you about how I came to be in this position today. I grew up in a town called Port Arthur, Texas. And Port Arthur is down where Louisiana, Texas, meeting the Gulf Coast. We're 90 miles east of Houston. It's a blue collar town, refinery town, predominantly black town. Man, I grew up being one of the only white kids at slumber parties, birthday parties, sporting events, you name it. Grew up in a giant melting pot of a city, y'all. My dad, Bob West, man, my parents are still alive to this day. My dad was a sports writer for 50 years in Port Arthur. He was the first sports writer in that part of Texas to put black athletes on the front page of a sports page. 1971, 
was the first time it ever happened. It was a running back out of Port Arthur named Joe Washington. First black guy to ever be on the front page. And man, when my dad did that, people down here lost their minds, man. They broke his windows out. They slid his tires. They sent him a bunch of hate mail. But my father saved that hate mail. And growing up, when my older brother, my younger brother and I were old enough to read that hate mail, he would sit us down and make us read every single last letter of that hate mail because he wanted us to see what it was like to take a stand and do the right thing. Because sometimes taking a stand and doing the right thing means you're going to stand alone. And I'm not sure he understood just how impactful that, that, that lesson was for his little middle son that would eventually go to prison one day and have to take a stand and stand alone. So I had a great family, y'all. had a wonderful family. I had every advantage, every, every privilege. I grew up with a life of privilege, y'all. This is what a privilege looked like. I had a great family. I got into substance abuse at a young age. When I was 10, I would get into my dad's beer in the fridge. I, I liked getting drunk. I would steal my mom's cigarettes. When I was 12, I started smoking pot. The worst part about this is oh, I've got this bad belief system building up, y'all. And, and our belief systems, they control our lives. They tell us how to do things. And if you have a bad belief system, it tells you how to do something the wrong way over and over again. And the longer you hold on to a bad belief system, well, the harder it is to get rid of. And, and my bad belief system at 10 and 12 years old I said, Damon, man, you're just drinking a little beer, smoking a little pot. You're not hurting anybody. You're not even hurting yourself. Couldn't have been more wrong. But y'all, God blessed me with a cannon for a right arm. With all my character def defects and all my character issues, I never had to address any of them because God blessed me with his right arm that was a cannon. And y'all, I was a star quarterback in my hometown. I was the, one of the best quarterbacks coming out of the class of 94 in the state of Texas, y'all. And y'all know how it is here in Texas, man. High school football is like a religion down here. I got a scholarship to play football at the University of North, North Texas, Division I college football. And man, when I got to college, the only two things I cared about were partying in my fraternity and being the starting quarterback on my Division I college football team. But life has a way of giving you these days that I call fork in the road days. And a fork in the road is this. Life's going to knock you down so hard some days that when you get back up and dust yourself off of that fork in the road, the whole world looks different. You got hit so hard, but you've got a choice to make. You know, you're going to make the right choice to go the right way, the wrong choice. They go the wrong direction. September 21st, 1996, we take the field against Texas A&M. Beautiful Saturday afternoon in College Station, Texas, man. We're, we're going out there. I'm 20 years old. I'm the starting quarterback from a Division I team. And by the third play of that game, I went down with a separated shoulder. And I never played college football again. When my college football career ended that day on Cal Field, I came up to that fork in the road, and I made a lot of wrong, a lot of wrong turns, a lot of bad choices, because my belief system, kicked in. And that's what happens when we face adversity in life, belief systems. If you've got a good one and you face adversity, well, you're in good shape. If you've got a bad one, buckle up. And I had a bad one back then. You know, instead of just drinking a little beer, smoke a little pot, now I'm doing the hardcore drugs, cocaine, ecstasy, pills, you name it. And if it was a drug in the 90s, I was probably putting it in my body and doing it. I graduated from college in 1999 in North Texas with a degree in sociology. I moved off to Washington, D.C. I got a job working in the United States Congress. After I worked in Congress for a few years, I worked for a guy running for president of the United States, raising money for him all over the country, political fundraise. And in 2004, when he dropped out of the race for president, I moved back to Dallas, Texas to train to be a stockbroker for one of the biggest Wall Street banks in the world, UBS, United Bank of Switzerland. And it was at that job as a broker that I came up to another very big fork in the road in life. It was 2004. I'm a pass out of my sleep. I'm passed out of sleep at work one day at my job at UBS. And Another broker comes up. He sees me sleeping at work. He wakes me up and he freaks out. He's like, he said, Damon, man. He said, wake up. He said, man, you can't sleep on this job. He said, the markets are open. You're messing with people's money. He said, they will fire you for that if they catch you sleeping. He said, come on down to the parking garage. I got something's going to pick you up. So I got up out of my desk. I went down to the parking garage with this guy. I think we're going to do a little cocaine because I'm big into cocaine in 2004. And when we got into his car, he handed me this glass pipe with these little crystal rocks in it. And I had never seen a glass pipe before, y'all. So, I mean, I freaked out on this guy. I'm like, man, what is that? What's that pipe? He said, man, just relax, Damon. He said, it's crystal meth. He said, you will love this stuff. Y'all, truer words have never been spoken. I fell in love with that drug that day. I smoked that drug one time, y'all, instantly hooked, just like that. And I could not give everything away fast enough for that drug. And that's the thing about addicts, y'all. I'm, I'm an addict. I'm in recovery today. I'm in a long-term program recovery. I'm in a 12-step program recovery today. So I can tell you about addiction from the other side. But addicts, man, no one takes anything from an addict. 
addicts, we give everything away. I gave up my job. I gave up my car, my home, my family, my savings account, my tethering to God. I went, I went from working on Wall Street to living on the streets of Dallas, y'all homeless. And I'm living in abandoned buildings. I'm sleeping in people's cars. I'm living in, in dope houses with other dope fiends because that's what I am as a dope fiend. And I start committing property crimes to fund my addiction once I'm out of money. I'm, I start off with simple property crimes at first. I'm breaking into storage units. I'm breaking into cars. Then it escalated to home burglaries. And y'all, when I committed these burglaries, I'll tell you about my victims. My victims are the most important component of the story. And, and being a criminal justice professor, I know that victims are the reason why we have a criminal justice system, y'all. My victims, when I broke into these people's homes, I didn't just steal their property. We stole a lot of property. Make no mistake about that. I stole something way more valuable from my victims, y'all. I stole these people's sense of security. And I do not know if they ever get that back. And some of them will live with that for the rest of their lives. But after three years of committing property crimes against the people of Dallas, Texas, the Dallas SWAT team in July 30, 2008, put an end to the Uptown burglaries. That's the, the day they arrested me. Or I tell audiences everywhere I go, man, that wasn't just the day I was arrested. That was the day I was rescued, y'all. I got pulled out of a situation I could not get myself out of. But I assure you, I didn't see it like that when I was in that holding cell that first day. So now we're back where the story started. I'm where I was telling you about being thrown in that holding cell that first 24 hours after my arrest. And after 24 hours in holding, the guards come to get me in Dallas County, and these folks are mad at me. And they've been, I've been terrorizing Dallas for three years, and they've got me in chains now. And they, they put me in one of the worst pods they could find, the most aggravated tanks they could find in Dallas County Jail. And within 24 hours of that, I'm in my first fight in County Jail. I mean, over a breakfast tray. And, and I'm scared to death, y'all. I'm freaked out. I'm scared to death. Uh, all I want to do is talk to my mom and my dad. I'm reverting back to almost being like a child. And so I get on the phone in the day room, and I call back home to Southeast Texas. And my dad, my dad answers the phone. Now, my dad is from an older generation. I mean, he's in his late 70s. Hell, I've never seen my father cry. But I heard my father cry at one time when I called home. Dallas County Jail. He is screaming and crying on the phone. He sounds like a wounded animal. He, and he's like, he's like, Damon, man, how we go so wrong with you? How we mess up so bad? And what could we have done different? And he's crying and now I'm crying. So my mom snatches the phone on my dad's hands. My mom, you know, she she grabs the phone. And she's like, baby, listen, your father can't talk right now. I've never seen your dad like this before in my life. But we need to have a serious conversation and we need to talk. She said, you need to understand that we love you unconditionally. She said, there's nothing you could do to make us not love you, Damien. She said, that was, that was a deal we made with God when he loaned you to us. She said, do you understand that we loved you unconditionally? And I told my mom, I was like, yeah, mom, I get it. You love me, you love me unconditionally. And she said, that's good, baby, because we just, we just gave you back to God. She said, there's nothing we can do for you anymore, Damien. She said, you are, you are now a captive audience to God and you better start listening. So my mom talked to me that night on the phone and encouraged me to get back in touch with, with God and Y'all, in 2009, in 2008, 2009, when I'm, you know, I'm still in my disease of addiction, I'm not getting high anymore, but all I can do is think about it is getting out and getting high. I told you at the beginning, I, I thought I could either bond out and get high again or get probation and get high. In fact, my prayer, I get on my knees every night in Dallas County Jail. I'll share my prayer with you. It's how crazy addiction is. I get on my knees every night in Dallas County Jail and I say the same prayer to God. Dear God, please, boy, get me out of this one. And if you do, bargain with God, right? If you do, man, I'll be a normal guy again. I'll go get a job. And man, I'll just smoke meth on the weekends, God. I got this. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's the mind of an addict. But obviously, those prayers were never going to be answered, man. That's a crazy prayer. So I knew that because when I got to trial 10 months later, and that jury came back in 10 minutes with a life sentence, it took my breath away, y'all. It took my mom's breath. My mom was in the front row of the courtroom. And when when the judge read the sentence out, my mother gasped. <gasps> you know, the sound only a mother can make when she hears her son get a life sentence in prison. And everything sped up after that. The bailiffs were on me, the sheriffs were on me, they throw my arms around my back, they handcuff me. They're dragging me out of the courtroom. And all I can think to say is they're dragging me out of the courtroom is, I'm sorry, Mom. And they take me and they put me in this little side room. It's got a bulletproof glass right there. They told me to wait. About five minutes later, my parents came in. They, they're going to give me one last visit with me before I go to prison. My dad walks in first, man. He's stoic. He's in stunned disbelief. He just saw his son with all this promise in life get a life sentence in prison. So my mom, 
My mom steps up. She does all the talking. She's the baby. She said, debts in life demand to be paid. She said, you just got hit with one hell of a bill from the state of Texas, too. She said, but, but you did the things they said you did at that trial, Damon. So you have to go and pay that debt to society. You owe that to Texas. She said, but you owe your father and I a debt, too, Damon. She said, we gave you all the opportunity, love, and support to be anything you want to be in life. And that's how you repaid us. What we saw in that court, she said, it's not going to work. That would never work. She said, we raised you in Port Arthur, Texas, a giant melting pot of a city, gave you a great moral compass, which you chose to not use. She said, so here's the debt you're going to pay to us when you go to that prison. She said, you will not get in one of these white hate groups, one of these Aryan Brotherhood type gangs, because you're scared because you're the minority in there. She said, that's not going to work. And you were never raised to see race and you're not going to start now. She said, you will not get any tattoos while you're inside that prison. And y'all, and I show people my sleeve all the time when I go speak everywhere. Y'all, I was in prison for almost 10 years. These guys want to, they, they want to tattoo every inch of your body in the joint. And every time one of these guys would hit me up in prison, be like, hey, Wes, let me put a tattoo on you. I'm like, hey, man, I can't do it. My mom said no. Because my mom told me that day, May 18, 2009, she wasn't kidding. She said, Damon, no gangs, no tattoos. She said, you come back as the man we raised. Don't you come back at all. It's tough love coming from my mom. She said, do you understand this debt you're going to pay? And through the tears, I was crying like a baby at this point. I was like, yeah, mom, I got it. I understand. But what do I know about prison, y'all? What did I just promise my parents? Man, I'm a white middle class guy in America. What do I know about the penitentiary, right? So I get back to my pot in Dallas County Jail, and I'm asking all these guys that had been to prison before, how am I going to survive? What am I going to do? And every guy I talk to, man, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, they're telling me the same thing. Dude, you got to get into a game, fool. You can't survive that game. They told me that lie. They tell people in the streets, in your cities, and all over America, the gang is your family. Big lie, y'all. The gang will protect you. The gang will love you. All lies. What wasn't a lie is what they told me. They said, man, you, you got a life sentence, Wes. You're going to the worst part of the Texas prison system where everybody on the building you live on has a life sentence. They call it the life sentence building, man. And they said, you can't even come off the life sentence building for five years, man. Man, Wes, don't be an idiot. Get into a gang. But there was this one guy, this older black man named Mr. Jackson. And Mr. Jack, well, I call him older. He's probably in his 60s. Mr. Jackson had gray and hair. He's what you call a career criminal. Man, Mr. Jackson been out of prison all his life, four or five times, man. He could not get it right in his own life, but he was the most positive guy I've ever met in my life, man. Mr. Jackson had a smile on his face everywhere he went. I mean, and this guy would come up to me in the morning, y'all. He would check on me every day, and he would share his wisdom with me, man. The knowledge that this man had built up six decades on this planet. And so he comes up to me one morning. He's got a cup of coffee in his hands and a smile on his face. And he said, West, Man, I've been watching how you're dealing with these knuckleheads and these dummies. Talking about you got to get into a game. He said, do not listen to these fools. He said, but let me tell you what prison going to be like. He said, you want to keep that promise you made to your mom and your dad, to God, to yourself? He said, let me tell you what prison going to be like. He said, let me lace you up. He said, the first thing you need to understand about prison, he said, prison is all about race. He said, the entire disgusting system is predicated upon race. He said, when you walk into that pot in prison, you're going to see a TV set in that day. Right? In front of that TV set, he said, you're going to see rows of benches. He said, the first row of benches, you can't sit on that row. That's for the blacks. That's our row. He said, you sit on that row, you get your head smashed in. He said, the second row of benches, well, that's for the Hispanics. He said, you can't sit on their row either. They'll smash your head in too. He said, the third row, if there's a third row, is where the white folks sit. He said, if there's no third row, white folks sit on the floor. He said, that's just the way it works in prison. You don't have the numbers in prison like you have in the free world. It's the opposite of the free world. Blacks got the numbers. He said, so don't get into a wreck over race. He said, because it's about race, when you walk in the door of that prison, the white gangs, the white gangs get the first dibs on you, West. The Aryan Brotherhood, the Aryan Circle, the White Knights, the Woods. He said, man, you have to fight all of them. He said, if you survive all that and you don't give in to their ideology of hate, out of fear, fear, ladies and gentlemen, we do so many things in life out of fear will make us see things that aren't real. They'll make us believe in a, in a world that isn't real and under reality. We'll make decisions that are, that are antithetical to our own good and the good of our neighbors out of fear, man. Fear is what makes people hate someone that doesn't look like them. Fear. 
my, my co-author and good friend, John Gordon. John says fear and faith have more in common than just the letter F to begin with. John says fear and faith both believe in a future that hasn't even happened yet. Fear is a negative future you can choose to believe in, or faith is a positive future you can choose to believe in. And John, my co-author, is always saying choose faith over fear. And that's, that's kind of what Mr. Jackson is saying today. He said, man, if you don't give in to the black gang, if you don't give in to the white gangs out of fear, he said, they get ready. Because after you get done with the white gangs, now the black gangs are coming after you. The Crips, the Bloods, the Gangster Disciples, the Mandingo Warriors. He said, the white gang is going to send the black gangs, and the black gangs will be happy to tee off on an independent white guy that will not get with his own race, his own skin color. He said, but if you survive all that, and you can survive all that, he said, you will earn the right to walk alone. He said, the strongest man in prison always walks alone, does not join a gang. He told me something about fighting that day, y'all. It's been a mantra that's lived with me for the rest of my life. When he said, you don't have to win all your fights, but you do have to fight all your fights. And that's a lesson in life, y'all. We're not going to, you can't win all your battles in life. You're going to lose sometimes. You're going to get your, your butt kicked and get knocked down. But like Jax is telling me that day, you got to get back up and keep fighting. But when he's telling me this, he, I mean, I'm like a deer in headlights. Y'all. He's telling me about all this, this terror and, 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 you know, violence I'm about to walk into. So that's what he said. He said, Wes, he said, let me back this up a little bit. He said, I want you, so let me try it another way. He said, I want you to imagine prison as a pot of boiling water. And he said, anything we put in this pot of boiling water, well, it's going to be changed by the heat, the pressure inside that pot. He said, I'm going to put three things in this pot of boiling water and watch how they change. A carrot, an egg, and a coffee bean. So he said, first things first, Wes, he said, if I put a carrot in that pot of boiling water we call prison, he said, what happens to the carrot? I was like, well, Mr. Jackson, the carrot turns soft. He said, that's right. He said, the carrot goes into the prison hard, the water hard. He said, but the water in the prison changes. The hard carrot turns it soft and mushy and weak. He said, the carrot got beat. He got robbed. May have got raped and he may have got killed. He said, you don't want to be the carrot in prison. He said, what about the egg, Wes? What happens to the egg in the pot of boiling water? I was like, Mr. Jackson, the egg turns hard, like a hard-boiled egg. He said, that's right, Wes. He said the egg is a shell that protects it physically, but inside that shell, that soft liquid core, the egg's heart becomes hardened. He said if your heart becomes hardened, now you're incapable of giving or receiving love. He said if you're incapable of giving or receiving love, you have become institutionalized and you will not come back as someone your parents recognize because your eggshell will have swastikas tattooed all over it. And that's when he asked me. He said, what about the coffee bean? Y'all, I had, I had no clue. I didn't know what happened to a coffee bean, the pot of boiling water. And that's what Mr. Jackson shared with me, one of the most important lessons I've ever learned in my life. He said, if I put a coffee bean into that same pot of boiling water we call prison, he said, now, now you got to change the name of the water to coffee. Because he said the coffee bean, that's the smallest of these three things. He said, small like you. Had the power to change the entire atmosphere inside the pot because the power was inside the coffee bean just like the power is inside of you. He said, everything else was changed by the water. The egg was changed by the water. The carrot was changed by the water. He said, but the coffee bean changes the water. He said, everybody in life, we put out energy, this negative, this positive energy. He said, whatever kind of energy you put out, you attract back. It's called the law of attraction. It works. He said, so if you want to walk around prison all the time with a mean mug on your face and a scowl, you want to try to look hard, he said, man, all you're going to do is attract the hardest inmates in your life. He said, man, when you're going to the license building, that can be a dangerous, even deadly endeavor to bring these guys into your world. He said, but conversely, if you walk around that prison with a smile on your face and you let those guys know they're not getting you, no matter what they do, they can't break you, man. He said, you will change prison from the inside out. And the best part about it is the other coffee beans in prison, the other positive inmates, they'll find you because of your energy. And the last thing, Mr. Jackson told me before I got in that prison bus in August of 2009 to be shipped off to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to go serve that life sentence that I had earned from that jury. Mr. Jackson looked at me and he said, West, go out there and go be a coffee bean. Be a coffee bean. And four words, this old man was shooting me straight. That means that the power is inside me. And if the power is inside me, it can't be in the hands of the criminal justice system. It can't be in the hands of the guards or the other inmates, not unless I give it to them. 
If the power is inside me, the power is truly inside me, man, then it doesn't matter what kind of environment I'm dropped off in. Even a maximum security level five penitentiary in the state of Texas, no matter what adversity I face in life, I won't just survive. I'll thrive. And I got my chance to find out, y'all. I got my chance to find out if that coffee bean philosophy was real. Prison was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, the most terrorizing, most dangerous thing I've ever been through in my life. That life sentence built in prison, man, my book, The Change Agent, my autobiography, I go into a lot of detail about those first two months of prison because it was, it was horrifying. It was, it was terrible. From the first day I walked in, Jackson told me, he said, man, when you walk in the door, you're going to get your heart checked. You know, and he said, the guy that comes up to you, man, the first guy that comes up to you, he's not coming to hurt you, man. He's coming to, to find out what gang you're with. But the second guy, he's coming to hurt you, man. Hit that guy as hard as you can. And it happened just like Jackson said, man. I walk in the door. One guy comes up. What gang you're riding with? What family you're riding with? And I'm like, man, get out of my face, little guy. I'm riding with God. He laughs at me. He tells me, God isn't here, homeboy. We kicked God out a long time ago, but we're here. We're coming to get you. And the next guy that comes up. Big white guy with a big swastika tattoo all around the top and say, big muscle up guy comes up. We get in a fight. It takes 20 seconds. He beats me up. My first fight in prison was over within the first 15 minutes of walking in the door in prison. And y'all, let me tell you about prison fighting. Man, for two months, I fought surviving that prison. From Dallas County Jail to the penitentiary, I probably got in three dozen fights and I lost. I physically lost 75% of those fights, y'all. Then I got my butt kicked all over that prison. But I won. I won every one of those fights by Mr. Jackson standards because I kept showing up. And, you know, I was locked up at the Mark Stiles unit in Beaumont, Texas, which is 10 minutes away from where I grew up in Port Arthur. So the good news was I got to see my parents all the time. The bad news was I was at Stiles. And Stiles is one of the toughest prisons in the state of Texas, y'all. It took me two weeks to get through the white gangs. And after the fighting was over with the white gangs, then it was just like Mr. Jackson said, the black gangs, sometimes more than one at a time. Y'all, I lived in so much fear those first couple of, There's some days I didn't even leave my cell. I didn't even go eat chow. Because every time they rolled those cell doors, I was worried about someone saying, hey, West, I want to look at you in the shower. Man, if someone in prison tells you they want to look at you in the shower, there's nothing gay about that statement. There's not, there's not, there's not, that's not a homosexual statement. What they're saying is they want to go see your boxing game. They want to look at your boxing game in the shower. Because there's no guards back there. There's no cameras back there. All that blood you're about to spill cleans up real easily out of the shower. So two weeks to get to the white gangs. After that, it was a black gang, sometimes more than one at a time. Six weeks into prison, y'all. I head on out to the rec yard one, one Monday morning because I'm going to earn some respect a different way. If I got to fight these guys, I'm going to do it playing sports because I'm an athlete, y'all. And I go out to the rec yard, the most segregated place out there in the life sentence building, and I get myself in a basketball game that, that Monday morning. A basketball game where there's no whites allowed in that basketball court, y'all. But I grew up being the only white guy in a basketball court. I grew up in a town called Port Arthur, y'all. I've been the only white guy. Or they couldn't scare me with that. But getting in that first game was the most vital step to making that happen, y'all. And after I got in that game Monday morning, I had to come back out there every single day and play basketball. Those guys, the most brutal basketball I've ever played in my life. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, man. And I'm getting pounded on by everybody. My own teammates are beating on me. And I'm hitting them back wherever I can. Saturday, Saturday, we're playing our game of basketball, y'all. When that game was over, these guys come up to me, man. These guys circle up where I'm in the basketball court. Biggest dude out there, man. There's blood from Houston named Jay Boy. Jay Boy says, man, Wes, you pulled something off out here in the basketball court this week. We had never seen a white boy pull off before. You took everything we had, and you gave it back when you could. That took guts. But you never, you never once got racial with us, man. He said, you don't have to worry about the blacks the rest of the time you're in prison, Wes. That felt good, y'all. I mean, you know what the first thing I thought about was, though? The first thing I thought about was Mr. Jackson and that coffee bean story. Because your big takeaway from the basketball court isn't about the scared white boy that went out there and faced his fears to earn some respect. We get that. That's on the surface. The big takeaway from the story of those black men on that basketball court. Those black men, some of those guys had 20 years of a bad belief says a guy that looks like me doesn't belong in their world. But in six days, those guys made a change. In six days, those guys became coffee bean. And that's when I first believed that the coffee bean theory could work. It was just in time, too, because I was becoming an egg. And I remember back in county jail, I asked Mr. Jackson, I said, hey, Mr. Jackson, what do you find more of in prison? And he fired back immediately. He said, eggs. He said, the egg is a natural evolution of a human being inside the environment you're about to go into. And he said, you will probably become an egg too. And you know what? Jackson was right. 
I was becoming that egg. The violence, the negativity, everything that is prison was breaking me down. I was becoming that egg. And y'all, I didn't want to become that egg. I didn't want to be like that prison was. So about, about two weeks after the basketball court, I, I'm in my cell with my cellmate named Carlos. So Carlos is a little Hispanic guy from San Antonio, a little bank robber from San Antonio, about five foot four, dangerous little dude. He was a lethal little guy. But Carlos and I were having a conversation in the cell that night. I told him about the coffee bean story. And that's what, that's what Carlos told me. He said, Damon, he said, I love the coffee bean story. He said, but you're no coffee bean and you're never going to be a coffee bean. Not with the way you think. And I was like, what do you mean, Carlos? He said, because the way you think controls the way you act. He said, all action is born of thought. And thoughts about action, he pointed to the day room downstairs with all these inmates running around being loud and crazy. He said, that prison day room is what thoughts about action look like. He said, none of those men will ever do the things they say they're going to do because all they do is just talk. He said, if you want to become that coffee bean, you have to change the way you think. You have to change your mindset. Your mindset, y'all. Your mindset is so important with every task you go into. He said, you have to change your mindset. He said, you have to quit looking at prison as a punishment and start looking at prison as an opportunity. An opportunity, man. I started this presentation out by talking about finding the opportunity in the verse. You know, we all, we've all been living in the world of coronavirus. We, you know, we all have to find what the opportunities were in coronavirus, too. Just like when I'm sitting in prison that day, and Carlos is telling me that prison wasn't a punishment. It was an opportunity, but it didn't register me that day. When Carlos told me that, I looked at him and said, what do you mean, man? We're serving life in a Texas maximum security prison. This is as big of a punishment as it gets. He said, this isn't a punishment, Wes, not unless you want it to be. He said, it's your opportunity. Your opportunity to work on yourself 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to become the best version of yourself possible, to become that coffee bean that you want to be. He said, what are you prepared to do with your opportunity? He wouldn't call prison a punishment. So the next, the ne next morning, I got up in my cell. My feet hit the cold concrete floor of the prison cell. And I said it out loud. Hey, God, man, thanks for this opportunity. And I got to work on myself that day. And I didn't believe it at first, y'all. I mean, I don't think this is something that, you know, this guy just jumped right in and his world started to change. No. Man. One thing I learned about prison is that results take time to measure. It's going to take a while to change a bad belief system and turn that around to something good. So I would get up every day. Days became weeks. Weeks became months. And months became years. But I finally figured out how to become that coffee bean inside that Max Security Prison. I'm going to share with you today how I did it. There were five ways of being a coffee bean. Five things that I have to do to this day all the time. So here goes. The first rule about being a coffee bean, the first thing I had to do to turn this thing around is I had to start using positive body language everywhere I went. That means you got to smile. Mr. Jackson told me in Dallas County Jail, he said, you will either infect the rooms you go into with your negativity or you'll affect them, your positivity. In fact, first effect. Your smile is powerful, y'all. Your smile, first thing your smile does is your brain is going to release endorphins. It's a chemical that makes you feel good. Now you've got something to give. You can't give what you don't have. And when you smile, whether it's in person or on Zoom or wherever, people see you smile. They read your body language for cues and they smile back. And in a room full of smiling, positive people, negative people have to get one of two choices. They either get with the program and become positive or they get out of those positive rooms because they can't stand that kind of positivity. And either way is okay because we want to have those positive rooms, positive workplace, positive environments, positive classes. It starts with a smile, y'all. Your smile is very powerful. The second rule by being a coffee meeting is getting up every day and working out of yourself in three areas, spiritually, mentally, and physically. And what I mean by that is, like, look, when I was in prison, I was locked up with guys that could play in the NBA. They could play in the, NBA, the NFL. These guys were massive physical specimens, because all they did all day long was work out on their bodies, but they didn't work out their minds. They didn't work out their soul. You want to be a complete person? You want to be a coffee bean? You got to work out on all three. So people ask me, talk, well, Damon, what is a spiritual workout? Well, and I'll give you my spiritual workout. I mean, when I got into recovery in prison, I got into an AA 12-step program, and I always have to say this line right here, the AA people get mad at me. I don't represent AA. But I, that's the 12-step that's the recovery program I started going to in prison and I'm going to go to for the rest of my life because the program recovery never stops. But I learned how to pray when I got into recovery. I learned how to pray. I got very spiritual, not religious, but spiritual when I got into prison. And I learned how to pray. And I say one prayer every single day to start my day. My spiritual workout begins with this prayer right here. I say, I get on my knees every morning. I say, hey, God, put in front of me what you need me 
to do today for you. And let me recognize it when I see it. And you can plug that prayer into any religion out there. It doesn't matter. I'm talking about a hybrid. If I'm doing what God needs me to do for him, then he'll take care of my needs. Not my wants, but my needs. That's my belief and my faith. You can choose your beliefs too. That's the wonderful thing about faith. You can choose your own path. That's my spiritual workout. My mental workout, mental workout is every, every book I read, every video I watch, every website I go to, uh, the, the social media I, I consume. When, what am I posting? Who am I following? These things. You are what you eat. That's not just about food. That's about everything you put these big brains of yours up here. And you're going to look like on the outside. You know, if you're sitting around watching something that calls itself news, but it's people screaming at each other, turn that stuff off. That's negative entertainment. America is sick right now, y'all. America is addicted to this negative entertainment stuff. That's why we end up hating each other. Turn the negativity off, man. Cut it off from your life because you become what you consume. And physical, got to take care of ourselves, y'all. You get one body in this life, you know. Try to get enough rest, you know. Get Try to eat the right foods. Get a little exercising every day. I mean, even if you're just walking around your, your block one time, start somewhere, spiritually, mentally, and physically. Those coffee beans are always trying to get, get in the best shape of their life. The third rule about being a coffee bean was understanding what the secret to life was. And the secret to life I learned is called servant leadership. And servant leadership is helping other people achieve their goals in life, helping to raise other people up to a different station in life. Because when we're helping other people, that's when we're at our best, y'all. Every one of us on this Zoom today, every one of us had help along the way. No one got to where we are by ourselves. Someone helped us get here. And it's incumbent upon us to find other people to help to reach their goals too. That's what servant leadership is. And, and look, every one of us, man, you may be doubting whether or not you have the power to help someone. Every one of us on this call has the power to help another human being. There's a story I go to for this from a guy named Mr. Rogers. And, and I can't see everybody's hands, but look, I'm going to tell you, I love Mr. Rogers growing up. I used to watch Mr. I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I'm dating myself here. But I love Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers, before he was Mr. Rogers, was a Presbyterian minister. He told a story about this, this church service. He went to a church service one day. It was in the early 1960s. He went to a church service one Sunday morning, and they had a substitute preacher come in that day. And Mr. Rogers said to this substitute preacher's sermon, and at the end of this guy's sermon, Mr. Rogers thought to himself, that was the worst sermon I've ever heard. He said, this guy was awful. He was terrible. He gave the worst sermon he's ever heard. It almost put him to sleep. And just as Mr. Rogers was about to turn to the little old lady next to him and tell her how awful this guy was, he stopped and bit his tongue. Because that little old lady next to Mr. Rogers, she turned to him, and she was in tears. She turned to him and she said, that was the most beautiful sermon I've ever heard. She said it was the absolute right thing I need to hear at the absolute right time in my life. And she said, I will never forget where I was this day that I heard this sermon. And that's when Mr. Rogers realized that every single one of us is endowed with this incredible ability, this incredible power to impact human life in a positive way. Even this preacher that he thought was so awful profoundly impacted this little old lady. But he learned another very important lesson that day. He learned that while he was coming in judgment, that little old lady, she was coming in need, in need. Right now, at this point in time in American history, so many of our brothers and sisters are coming in need. What are you going to do every day to meet that need head on? That is servant leadership. Fourth rule by being a coffee bean is knowing what you do and do not control in life. And y'all, this was a tough one. And it took me going to prison and being stripped of everything in life to understand that I control exactly four things. And the same four things you control in your life too. You control exactly what you think, what you say, what you feel. And most importantly, everybody's going to see what you do, your actions, what you think, what you say, what you feel, and what you do. And if it's not one of those four things, you do not control it. Your entire world of control stops at your ears. Everything you control is inside this head of yours up here. Do not relinquish control of one of those four things. That's when you become a prisoner in your own mind. And the prison of your mind is a hard prison to walk out of. The fifth rule by being a coffee bean is perhaps one of the most important to a guy like me. The fifth rule by being a coffee bean is that your past does not define you. That's right. Your past doesn't matter. Your past wins don't matter. Your past loss. If my past defined me, you wouldn't be sitting, 
sitting here listening to some ex-con from Port Arthur, Texas, talking about the lessons he's learned and how to become a coffee bean inside of a maximum security prison. But it's because our past is our lesson, y'all. And that's a wonderful thing. We can, we can learn from it and we can teach others with our past. We're teachers, man. We understand that. Your past is your lesson. The present today is a gift, not a gift for you, but a gift for what you can do for others. That's the gift of life. And the future, the future is your motivation. But motivate yourself with the right thing. Here's the warning in my presentation, y'all. If you don't motivate yourself with the right stuff, if you're driven by a burning desire for material things and, and things that are not really yours to have, then you run the risk of becoming that prisoner in your mind. I'm going to tell you something. This is from a guy that served almost 10 years in the maximum security prison or the fact that I'm a professor, adjunct professor now at our school, and I teach a class called Prisons in America. So I can tell you with authority what the hardest prison in this country is. The hardest place to do time in the United States of America is the prison in your mind. Man, I need more people. More people out here in the free world that are locked up than I ever did when I was in prison. More people are in prison by their thoughts and by their things than by steel bars and barbed wire and concrete. You can take that to the bank. And if you become a prisoner in your own mind, it's the hardest prison to walk out of. Way harder than the physical prison. Hey, speaking of walking out of the physical prison, let me tell you about the day I walk out. I'm coming out. I got my mattress under one arm. I got a couple bags of property. Same way I walked in, man. And I can see the gate. I'm getting ready to leave. And, and, and coming down the other sidewalk down there is this old cellmate of mine named Sabor. I say, oh, it's the same age as me, 45 years old, just like me to this day. And this guy is like my brother from another mother, man. Sabor, a black Muslim man from Dallas, man. This guy and I, cellmates and we would sit up all night and talk about all kinds of stuff. I learned so much from so self-taught guy in prison man my brother from another mother man I still put money in support his support's not getting out anytime soon I put money in his book take his phone calls every month I love this guy he's coming down the sidewalk that day that I'm walking out he sees me we lock eyes he runs up I drop my bag we hug each other man he's crying I'm crying he says man Damon he said, he said I'm so happy for you your family you know I'm so happy for you that you have this opportunity he said but I got to ask you something, man. I got to know something. And I'm like, support, man. What is it, man? Ask me anything you want, brother. Anything. Tell me. He said, man, when you get out of here, West, are you going to talk about the stuff you saw in here? Now, what Sabor wants to know, he wants to know, am I going to talk about the stuff we talked about in 45 so? Whenever I was coming up in that prison system with him, and we would stay up all night. We would talk about disparity in the system. We talk about racism in America. We talk about social justice stuff. Sabor wants to know, am I going to talk about that stuff in the free world where everybody can hear? And man, I looked at my brother and I told him, I said, Sabor, man, you know I will. When I get on my feet, brother, you know I will. And what he said back to me that day became a call to action in my life because his words hit me right between the eyes. When Sabor looked at me and he said, good, sometimes they lock up the right guy. Sometimes they lock up the right guy. Let's talk about racism in America. It's what Sabor wants me to talk about. In order for racism to exist, there has to be an imbalance of power, y'all. That imbalance of power has to say that one race has so much more power over another race or other races that they can write laws to affect the way people live, where they live, where they go to school, how their lives are in this country. And in the United States of America, white people have that power. That's what racism is. Now, whenever a white friend comes up to me and says, hey, man, Damon, that person of color over there said something racist towards me or did something racist, I, I, no, I check them because we need to help people out. We, you know, I said, definitions are important. And I tell them, you're not talking about racism. What you're talking about is called prejudice. And prejudice means to prejudge. Every race can be prejudiced against each other. Whites don't have any exclusivity to prejudice. But racism? That's an exclusively white thing. It's very difficult for a white person in America to say they have experienced racism before because racism, as I said before, is about that imbalance of power and white people have that power. That's why it's so hard for white people to understand racism because most of them have never experienced it. But I have. And this is what Sabor is talking about. I have experienced racism before. I've lived in a society where being white was no longer an advantage in my life. Where being white means that I can't sit on a certain row of benches. Or being white means that I get my face kicked in 
because of the color of my skin. Man, I've lived in a society like that. So I understand racism. And I've been inside that prison system for y'all. I can tell you that when you walk into a prison and you walk into a penitentiary in this country, man, half the population that looks back at you, almost half that population is black faces, man. Black men. Black men make up six and a half percent of our population in this country, y'all. Yet they make up almost 50% of our population in the prison system. You mean to tell me that six and a half percent of the population commits 50% of the crime? No, that's not what's happening. What's happening, y'all, is America is sick right now, y'all. America is sick with this problem of racism, man. And this racism goes deep. And if you want to understand what your brothers and sisters are going through, Look inside a prison system. That's why you take the temperature in this country. There's not one criminal justice system in this country, y'all. There's a lot of different criminal justice systems in this country. There's a black one. There's a white one. There's a brown one. There's a rich one. There's a poor one. Hell, there's one for cops. And it all depends on who you are and where you fit in the spectrum. It's the kind of justice you can expect to receive in this country if you get caught up in these people's criminal justice systems. I tell people this everywhere I go. My class gets this lecture on the first day, y'all. But you know what? I love this country. I love the United States of America, and I know y'all do too, and, and I want to fix this. You know what really angers me is someone that will come into a room and tell me, hey, this is what the problem is, but they don't tell me how you fix the problem. They don't tell me what the solution is. I can't stand that person, so I won't be that person. I'm going to tell you today how I think we fix the problem of racism in America. This comes from my experience. UHD doesn't endorse this. No one has to endorse this. This is Damon West's personal story of where I think we fix racism. There's two reasons why white people will not get involved with racism in America more than what they do. One is that they don't understand racism because they've never experienced it. And two is they're scared to death to talk about it because of that cancel culture out there. Because if they say or do the wrong thing, they can lose everything in the process. And if you're a white person in America, your safest play is just to stay quiet till the riots and the protests stop. That's not going to fix the problem, though, y'all. So here's how I think we fix this. White people, people that look like me, we have to get off the, get off the sidelines, get in the game, and start listening. We have to start listening to what black and brown people are telling us about racism, because for the most part, we've never experienced it, so we have to listen to people that have. Now, that's what white people need to do. Let me tell you what I think black people need to do to fix this problem about racism in America. White people, you're going to have to invite white people into these conversations with grace. And when you invite someone into a conversation with grace, man, you're saying that, you know what? You come into this conversation right here, you may not say or do the right thing, but you're not going to get canceled out in the process because you're here willing to learn and I am willing to teach. And when you invite someone into a conversation with grace, you cancel the cancel culture out. And when we do those two things, that's when I think we get together in the grassroots in this country and change the problem of racism in America. But until that happens, nothing is going to change. That's why Savor said sometimes they lock up the right guy. So look, I'm going to wrap this up with what I call my call to action. My call to action is this, y'all. Same one Mr. Jackson gave to me 12 years ago when I was leaving Dallas County Jail to go serve that life sentence. Life is a pot of boiling water. You know what to call your three choices now. You can be like the carrot that turns soft and sad and weak in that pot of boiling water called life, or the egg that turns hard and mad and mean and angry. You know what? You're going to have carrot days and egg days. I had one, we had that freeze a couple weeks ago. I had carrot and egg days all, all week. But I learned something else. I'm going to give you one last nugget from a maximum security prison in Texas. I learned that the power inside me, like that coffee bean, extends, extends to this other power inside me. It's the power inside you. You have a power inside you to start your day over anytime you want. Having a bad day, that's a choice. And anytime you want, you can stop your day and start it over. You're having a carrot day, having an egg day, take a step back, take a deep breath and say, you know what? I don't have to live like that. I don't have to be the carrot. And I don't have to be the egg. Those are choices. And then you choose to jump in that pot of warm water called life. And you tell life, you know what? Turn it up. I've got this. And the longer the coffee bean sits in that pot of warm water called life, the stronger that pot of coffee is going to be. So my call to action, y'all, is the same one Mr. Jackson gave me 12 years ago when I was getting my prison bus. And it's this. You go out there and you go be coffee. Be a coffee bean, y'all. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Damon, very, very much. Wow, that was, that, was, uh, that was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Thank you for sharing. Um, uh, wow. So I am going to uh, open it up. We have a, a couple of questions, but I also want to just invite people to use the Q&A 
we have about a uh, half hour left of time if anyone would like to ask a question that hasn't already uh, asked a question. But there is a question uh, from a Van Lamb. He thanks you for sharing your testimony and he wants to know when you got out of prison, was it hard to let go of all the guilt? And what can you advise to others who struggle to let go of things that they've done in the past? Who asked that question, Stephen? Van Lamb. Van, thanks for asking the first question. You win a copy of my autobiography, The Change Agent, and inside this book, it's gonna answer your question more fully than what I'm about to give you right now. Was it hard to forgive myself and let go of all those things? You bet. And that's where a program recovery comes in handy. Every addict needs to have a program recovery. That get, a program recovery gives you tools in life, but a program recovery gave me the ability to let go of my resentments in life. A resentment is a number one offender of an addict. And my biggest resentment in life wasn't towards someone else. My biggest resentment was towards me. Because of the choices I made in life and the people I had to hurt along the way to make the, making those choices, my resentment against me was the hardest one to let go of. But I had to learn to let go of it, man. I had to learn to let go of my resentments in life because if I don't let go of that resentment, that resentment will send me back to prison because I'll pick up and use it again. So absolutely, man. Letting go of that, that anger at myself was the toughest one to, to let go of. But today I, I live a life free of resentment. And every night I ask my higher power, you know, do I need to forgive anybody before I go to bed? Because I'm not taking that resentment with me to another. The opposite of resentment is forgiveness. And a resentment is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Great question, man. So I, I have a question that I want to ask you. What do you do every day towards your recovery? Is there something that you do? Is there readings that you do? Is there writing that you do? What do you do? Uh, you know, my, my program recovery, the fourth through 10 steps in, in a 12-step program, you pretty much have to work every day. And I'm always constantly taking a, a personal inventory, Stephen. I'm asking myself what my shortcomings are in life, what my fears are, what kind of things hold me back. Do I have resentments? Do I owe someone an apology? That's the eighth step, man. The eighth step of, of the AA program is like, hey, you make a list of all the people you've harmed and you become willing to make amends. And the ninth step says you make those amends. You go out and make those amends, except when to do so would cause others harm. So every day, Stephen, I've got I've to be my own personal janitor in my life, you know, because I've got to keep my side of the street clean. And what that means when I keep my side of the street clean, that means I'm working through all my resentments, all my shortcomings, every apology I have to make, I've got to do that every day. Every, every person I need to forgive, especially the people that only ask for forgiveness, I've got to do this every day, Stephen, if I want to stay sober. That's the most important thing. And I go to my meetings, too. Probably two or three days a week, I get to hit meetings. We have in-person meetings down here in Walmart. So I get to go to in-person meetings. We wear a mask. We sit apart. But uh, that's going to be my life for the rest of my life. I hang around a bunch of other people in recovery and listen to their stories, too. So I don't have to go back out and drink again. Okay, thank you. So the second question is from... Uh, Elia or Elia Gonzalez, uh, um, she wants to know, Mr. Van, can you, I mean, uh, Mr. West, can you, give an, can you give an advice for parents to take their children in the, on the right path? Uh, you know, and I'm going to tell her, you get to win the Coffee Bean for Kids, my kids book that just came out. So um, I've been wanting to give some books away to everybody. So yeah, you know, the advice I would give for parents to, to have their kids go on the right path is accountability. Accountability is one of the biggest things I see that's lacking right now in American culture. I mean, people don't have to be accountable, accountable for anything. It feels like anymore people, you know, no one has, not no one. That's, that's absolutely term. It's, it appears that there's a lot less people taking accountability for their actions than there used to be. And I think teaching kids accountability and ownership of their mistakes is a great first step and teaching kids the principles about being a coffee bean that they can impact their world, uh, the world around them by their positivity too. Hey, um, all right, next question. Um, let's see here. Um, this is from Dr. Jerry Wallace, our assistant uh, dean. Uh, he mentioned, he says, you mentioned playing basketball with black males. What did it teach you from a cultural perspective? You mentioned racism, et cetera. How did it make you feel before and after the engagement? And Dr. Wallace, that, that's a good question. So, you no, know, I grew up on the basketball courts of Port Arthur. Like I said, being the only white guy on the west side of Port Arthur playing basketball. So being the only white guy 
wasn't a new thing for me, but, but being the target of all the, the animosity, the animus and, and the hatred and, and, and racism out there on the basketball court, it made me understand what blacks have been talking about for so long, man. Because now I'm out there, I'm the only white guy in this world where these people don't want me, I don't belong, but I'm trying to, to prove that I belong. And it gave me the most critical understanding about what the struggles are of a black man in America. And, and look, I'm not saying that I know all the struggles of a black man in America, but I'm telling you something, for about six days on my basketball court, I felt what it feels like to, to, be, to be looked at different, to be pushed around, to be shoved around, to, for someone to let you know how different you are and how much you don't belong. So yeah, it gave me, what I think the most critical thing it gave me, doctor, is empathy. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so let's see, uh, Deanne, um, forgive me if I'm saying your names wrong, but Deanne Chang wants to know, how do you prevent someone from trying drugs? He, think, he says his kids think weed is okay. However, weed usage leads to other drugs. Yo, so Deanne, last thing, you're not faculty, so the last thing I wanted to, do is uh, give you my book, The Coffee Me. Um, that's the last book I have. So I don't have any more books to give away for questions. But so look, personally, I think the gateway drug is not weed. I think the gateway drug in this country is alcohol. Well, I mean, depending on, on who you are and your cultural background, but I mean, you know, a lot of people try alcohol for the first time and, and that's a drug. And if you're young, you're trying alcohol, it's illegal, it's, you know, you're, you're in a criminal addictive behavior. But I would tell, uh, you know, I would t tell your kids that usually these things don't just end right there. These, these, uh, these things start creating bad beliefs. My bad, you know, one of the biggest fights I got into prison, when I'm walking that fight, it, it occurs to me that all this that's going on in my life, all the problems that I've created in my life and the lives of other people, all started with a can of beer and a joint. And when that realization hit me, man, it was like a ton of bricks, a can of beer and a joint. And that's the reality, man. These things usually start out as something we feel is some, something small, but they become a lot bigger. Um, so, you know, look, I've got videos I can send you to, to share with your kids too. I mean, stuff I talk about, about starting out smoking weed and drinking a little bit. So anything I can do to help, let me know and I'll send you those videos. All right, so I, but I want to ask you a question about your foundation, but before I do that, um, I want uh, a few of our students are saying uh, that they want to know where they can get your merchandise, where they can find it for sale. Um, and let's see, one of your students in your classes wants to know when she can meet you and get the book. She wants to take a picture with you. Um, and uh, let's see here, one more here. Um, yeah. Not, um, Mr. Chang wants to know where, where you can, where he can find the videos. Um, and then one last question. Uh, well, why don't you answer those questions first and then I'll get to that last question. So the videos can be found on, I got a YouTube site, just uh, damonwest.org is the name of the YouTube site. Um, the shirts and stuff like that come from a website called nextstepbrands.com nextstepbrands.com this guy out of florida makes t-shirts uh, but uh the uh question is, so my books can be found on amazon barnes and nobles anywhere books are sold the coffee bean man that book is you know y'all i gotta tell you it's been amazing because that book is in every language on the planet that book is in chinese it's in spanish french italian german uh vietnamese korean arabic the, the coffee bean is literally all over the world right now. So um, my book's going to be found anywhere. So did I answer every question there, Stephen? Yeah, I, I think you did. Um, so we have before, um, and I do, I really want to know about your foundation. But before we talk about that, one last question here is uh, from Dr. Rhonda Scherer. She wants to know what you uh, tell your, what do you tell yourself to keep going and not just to give up? Huh. Dr. Scherer, I tell people this all the time. And this is something that goes through my head. My worst day in prison is better. Than, my worst day out here is better than my best day in prison. I have a ton of perspective in life. And I tell people all the time that this perspective that we have in life gives us a well to pull from our experiences with. Man, no matter what life hands me out here, 
I'm not waking up inside of a maximum security prison. And like I said before, there's a lot of different ways to be in prison. Physical prison is just one of them. And I would argue also, Dr. Sher, that, that physical prison is not the hardest prison in time. When people are locked up up here, America has to change its attitudes towards two things in this country. This is going into a deeper subject, but America has to change its attitudes towards mental health and substance abuse. We have failed as a country that we have locked up generations of sick people, you know, through mental health and substance abuse. And so I think there's more people that are in prison by their thoughts and by their things than by steel bars and barbed wire and concrete. And, and my thing is I want to help people from becoming those prisoners in your mind. And one of those things is to remind people that you only control four things. And I have to, I have to remind myself many times a day, you know, the things I'm trying to control, if it's not one of the things that it's mine to work on, I've got to let that go. And I've got to let that happen around me. And that's a very tough thing to do because that whole think, say, feel, and do thing, it sounds good, but it's not easy. It's not easy to relinquish control of the things that you think you want to control. Yeah, I always look at it like this, you know, say God's line, you know, and I don't know what religion everybody is and it doesn't matter really, honestly. I mean, I talk about a higher power all the time. So your higher power, the line for your higher power is just infinitely long. That's a big line. And, and, and the way it was explained to me that every time I try to grab something off my higher powers line, things that I don't control, well, I hurt myself or I hurt others because I'm not a higher power. I'm not God, you know, but I've got a line too. I've got a little line that's about a one inch line. And my little one inch line is different than that infinitely long line because my little one inch line is mine. And on my little one inch, my little one inch line is actually called humility because humility is defined as being right sized. And when we're right sized, then we can be useful to other people, you know? And on my little one inch line is those four things I control what I think, what I say, what I feel, what I do. So I remind myself many times a day, Dr. Shu, that's not on my line. If it's not something that's on my line, I remind myself it's not on my line, Dan. It's not on my line. Good in theory, but tough in practice. Amen to that. Okay, so Lab, before we close, tell me about your foundation, what it does, how people can get involved, that sort of thing. Oh, man, I'm so excited about this. Okay, so my foundation, the Be a Coffee Bean Foundation uh, in December, I started a foundation during the pandemic. I thought, you know what? I want to start a foundation. I want to find ways to help other people out. Um, these amazing things have happened in my life. You, know, you think about all this stuff. I was locked up five years ago. All right. I was serving life five years ago in a maximum security prison. And today I teach about prisons in America. But, uh, but I go all over the country and I get to speak. And I have books and I, I, I've got a married. I've got a family. I mean, so my life is as rich as a man can have it, man. I've got this wonderful life, but how do I give back? How do I find ways to be a servant to others? Because that's one of the main things that's going to keep me sober is, is finding ways to be a servant leader every day. So I started the Be a Coffee Bean Foundation. I was having dinner last year with a buddy of mine named Dabo Sweeney. Dabo Sweeney is the head coach at Clemson. And his wife and, and he were having dinner with my wife and I. And he told me a story about this group that he raises money for at his foundation called Call Me Mr. Now, Call Me Mister is a program that takes black young men that graduate high school and they're in an inner city somewhere, and, and they have it in South Carolina. Let's say in South Carolina, they come from an inner city in, South, in Charleston, let's say. They graduate high school, and the Call Me Mister program at Clemson says, hey, son, we'll give you a scholarship to Clemson for elementary education, and, and at the end of that time, you're going to be mentored while you're in college, and you're going to graduate. You're going to teach your, take your elementary school teacher certification exam, and then you're going to go out and teach in a community somewhere, a, a, a Title I school, a, a, an at-risk school, we're going to put you back into a classroom in an elementary school because there's studies that show, Johns Hopkins studies that show that if a black boy has a black male teacher in the classrooms in the formative years between second and fifth grade, well, this kid's like 38% more likely to finish school himself, right? And so what they're trying to do is find black men to be teachers in schools in America. 2% of the teachers in the American public education system are black men. So they're trying to put black men into the public education system and in, in the elementary school level. So when Dabo was telling my wife and I about this, that night my wife and I went home and talked and they were like, okay, now we found the purpose of the foundation, but we're not gonna do Call Me Mister because that's already being done. But what we wanna do is Call Me Mister inside of a prison, Stephen. And so, I pitched the idea first to the, the Department of Prisons, Department of Corrections in the state of South Carolina, because that's where the Call Me Mr. program is. And, 
the South Carolina prison director, who's a friend of mine, just wasn't ready to make that move. Just didn't know if he had enough political will in the state of South Carolina to do it. Went back to Texas, had a conversation with some of the politicians here, people in the criminal justice committees. And, ah, just not enough political will to do it. February 5th, I called my friend, Jimmy LeBlanc, the secretary of prisons in the state of Louisiana. I said, you know, Secretary LeBlanc, I got this program I want to pitch to you. Can you just give me an audience? Give me an hour. I'll zoom in my buddies from Clemson from the Call Me Mr. program. So we brought the foundation people to Baton Rouge. We sat in this room in the headquarters of the, direct, of the corrections, uh, the DOC in Louisiana. My buddies from Clemson zoomed in. We had a conversation for the next hour and a half about how we could take the Call Me Mr. program and put it inside of a prison. Here's what my foundation is doing. We are in the state of Louisiana. We just started two weeks ago. We are going to find five black male inmates, five currently, currently serving time offenders in the state of Louisiana. Now these, these offenders are gonna have non-aggravated, non-violent, low level crimes that have not a lot of time left on their sentence, and they've got the aptitude to finish college, get into college, and take their teacher certification exams. My foundation is going to help pick these five men from all over the prison system in the state of Louisiana, and they're going to ship all five of these men, those first, first cohort, to one prison called the Hunt Unit, right outside of Baton Rouge. And they're going to put these five men on the same wing. And matter of fact, we're going to have another guy come in from another program they have that's a lifer, and this lifer is going to live with these guys and be like a mentor to them. This guy's never going to go home, the lifer, but the, these other five men, these men are going to go to school inside that prison. In Louisiana, we're going to try to get LSU on board to be our, our member college, and we're going to send professors into this prison. And these guys are going to get an elementary school education. Now, my foundation, we're committed to paying for all their education that, that Pell Grants and scholarships don't cover, all the materials they need, and, and the help to pay for the LSU professor through the Call Me Mr. program. We're going to have mentors coming there, a living learning community set up inside of a prison. And when, we, when these guys graduate, the governor is going to grant these guys parole, and they're going to stick them in the toughest school districts in the state of Louisiana, the toughest elementary schools in the state of Louisiana, and make these guys into teachers, make these guys into the ultimate, ultimate educator mentor there is in, in a school. Because think about this, man. You're taking a... a you're solving all kinds of criminal justice system problems at this point. You're, you got, you've got pre-interventions. You've got second chances. You're reversing that pipeline from school to prison and turning it into a pipeline from prison to school. You're putting a twist on the whole pipeline. Now you're taking people from inside of a prison because you've got all these black men sitting around in these prisons, and you've got some of these guys that can go in and become these teachers. And, and, and I truly believe, Steve, I truly believe that my foundation, one of the things we have to do, it's in order for you to succeed and be successful, in order for you to be successful, you have to have the tools necessary for success. And this is where having an ex-con that starts the foundation can really help out because I've been through the re-entry process. When I got out of prison, I went through the re-entry process and I had a lot of help. I had family there waiting for me and everything, but most guys don't have that. So what my foundation, here's the twist. What my foundation is, is promised to do to these five men that are going to be our first cohort in every class after that is we will make sure that your first year student teacher salary is covered by us because we're not going to take you out of a classroom, out of a prison and stick you in a classroom. We're going to make you a student teacher and we don't want the taxpayers to pay for any of this stuff. So we're going to make you a student teacher. We're going to pay your salary that first year. You're going to learn with another teacher. We're going to give you a car. We're going to give you a wardrobe. We're going to give you a place to live. We're going to give you all the tools necessary to succeed because it will all be for not Stephen, if we just work on these guys when they're in prison and then one day they make parole and tell them, hey, good luck, man. Go out there and go be a teacher. Go be a coffee. It doesn't work like that. We want to make sure these guys have the right tools necessary to succeed because we truly believe wow. that they can stop the incarceration process. The generational incarceration problem in America can be fixed like this. And I'll tell you, Steve, we do it with one state and it's successful. Every state in America will allow to be a coffee bean foundation yeah, to do that's, this. That's amazing. Wow. Wow. So how can people get involved? Uh, you know, the website is being, this is so, happening so fast. The website's being built right now. But it, look, at one point, the University of Houston downtown has the Call Me Mr. program on its campus. Two, two campuses in Texas. University of Houston downtown and, and 
ironically enough, the University of North Texas, where I got my bachelor's degree from, where I played college football, these are the only two places in Texas. What I want to do, my vision is this. After this works in Louisiana, I'm bringing this program to Texas. And I want to bring University of Houston downtown professors into the prisons here in Texas and make them a partner program in the Texas prison system and turn this turn the state of Texas into a into a what we call the Mr. Coffee Bean program. That's what our program is called, the Mr. Coffee Bean. There'll be a website up for it in about a month, but we're we're excited. The, the, the first lady of Louisiana says she wants inmates sitting in class by August and have LSU professors in there teaching. So we're we're hurrying up right now to get our cohort fit. All right. That sounds wonderful. All right. Well, I think that takes us to the end uh, of our presentation today. Damon, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I think you've inspired, not only have you inspired us, you've uh, sort of um, uh, made the call to action for everybody. If you can do what you did in a lot more tough, probably a lot tougher situations than a lot of us face, and, and I agree with you. I think a lot of us are stuck in our minds with what we can do and what we, can, what we think we can't do. So thank you very much. Um, we, I hope to have you back another day uh, to inspire us again. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, y'all. Go be a coffee bean. Thank you. Thank you.